Okay, well, uh, good morning, everyone. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about um, just uh, general disease management and watermelon um, to consider this year. So first, we're going to talk a little bit about fusarium wilt. Uh, this is a disease that is caused by fusarium axisporum form of specialis nivium. We call it FON for short, because it's a really fun pathogen. It's not, actually. Um, it's really host specific, so crop rotation would be a really effective management strategy for this one. It is a soil borne. Once you have it in your field, uh, you do have to live with it for a long time. The spores can persist from uh, the literature reports anywhere from five to 20 years. Um, so, you know, going back to watermelon can still be a little bit risky, especially if the inoculum has had a chance to build up. Um, and something that is really interesting about this disease is that the infection actually really occurs early in the growing season because the pathogen prefers cooler soil temperatures, but you only see the symptoms later in the, in the season as it gets hot and then the plants look wilted, as you can see in these images, because um, all those vascular tissues become um, sort of like inflamed and then you get that wilting. Um, so typical symptoms that we see for this disease will be something we call unilateral wilting, which is that you may see just one vine with wilting and the rest of the plant will look pretty okay. Uh, you will also see like patchiness in the field. So it will occur in hot spots in your field. Some areas will look diseased, the RLS will, other areas will look fine. You will also see vascular discoloration here if you were to cut your, like the crown area of the stem open. Um, and then the way this, this enters your field is typically uh, to tran infected transplants. So it's a really easy way for it to come. Um, infected seed, that sometimes happens too. That seed can be infected and then you plant that seed. Um, and then it's a soil borne. So, you know, moving soils from infected field to a field with no history of fusarium can be risky. So if you know that you have a field with fusarium, you may want to work that field last so you're not spreading it around. Um, and as I was saying, it survives long-term in the field by producing this uh, survival structure called chlamydospores. So, you know, kind of like general management that we recommend is obviously trying to use pathogen-free seed. It's really important to go to reputable uh, seed sources and transplant sources. I think that uh, when I was hired here in 2013, we didn't have this disease very widespread in North Carolina. And I want to say around 15, 16, we started seeing it a lot more widespread. And it was largely because a batch of infected transplants entered the state. Uh, so you have really have to be vigilant about the quality of your planted material. Uh, there are some resistant and foreign varieties uh, because this pathogen has races. So there's like race uh, one, two, and a debated race three. Um, and we have some resistant watermelons, so definitely that's a, a, a thing to do. We can also apply effective fungicides at planting. We don't have a lot of effective active ingredients, but the ones we have are very good. If we use it as a preventative uh, application right at planting or very shortly after planting. Um, I know most people are producing in bare ground, but you know if you can help it, sometimes planting in raised beds with plastic mulch can also really help because it raises that soil temperature and the pathogen prefers cooler soil temperature. So that's another thing one can do if you, if you have a bad field. Um, people also recommend a five-year rotation to try to keep inoculum levels down as much as possible. Uh, some cover crops have shown to have some suppression activity and grafting is another really, really good method. So we have some good root stocks available, not commercially. Uh, actually, Trifis here in the mountains in North Carolina sells grafted transplants. So if you have a bad field, that's definitely another thing to uh, consider. So I'm going to show you results from um, a trial we did in 2018 with Proline, um, which is a product is probably the most effective product for this disease. And then one that back then was called adepinin because we worked on it under like experimental uh, conditions, uh, but now it's available as Miravis Prime. So uh, we did essentially several combinations of the proline and the adepinin applications as a soil application that here we're calling a drench and then uh, foliar sprays. Because uh, both these products have um, essentially labeled, at least Proline has one ground application labeled and then two foliars. Adepidin has ground application and foliar applications, I believe, with no limit. 
Um, here you have your non-treated control. So as you can see, we have plenty of disease pressure, which is darker green bars. And here from what you can see really quickly in the results is that all the uh, treatments that have the proline applied uh, and a ground application at planting or sh very shortly after planting were the ones that have the best outcomes. So this is definitely a product that if you have fusarium, you really want to get that proline application in when, when you're at the transplant stage. That said, adepinin does have some efficacy, not as strong, but because the label allows for more applications of adepinin via ground application, it could be a good partner as a follow-up drip application. Um, although I, I'm not sure that drip is actually labeled and that I'm thinking about it. It is a ground application, chemigation, I think it is the one. It's overhead chemigation and another one, so directed spray, I believe, for adepinin, but um, those could be a good partner applications later on. And this is just to kind of give you a visual of really how dramatic it was. You know, if you have proline applied at transplant, plants are very happy. If you don't, even though you're using another product that is less effective but still effective, uh, it's a dramatic difference. So definitely that proline is, is pretty good. Um, we also did a trial uh, looking a little bit at the resistance that is available out there for seed companies because we were curious how it really held up to, um, you know, the pathogen populations that we see here in North Carolina. And these are the races that I was talking about and kind of like how the resistance is broken up with um, known watermelon cultivars. Uh, so we planted these varieties and we also did a combination fungicide trial to see how that held up. And this is kind of how it happened. Um, basically, the non-treated, if you see down here, you can see that obviously the line that was meant to be resistant was resistant in the trial. Well, this it had the lowest disease level, followed by the tolerant, followed by the susceptible. Uh, regardless of that, that uh, proline application at planting really, really does help. You can see it here again. It really brings those disease levels down. Now, when you switch it, um, you know, in a resistant background, obviously adepidin and proline do really good, but once you have tolerance or susceptibility, then, you know, adepidin and miravis prime is not as strong. So again, I, I would say the miravis prime is a good partner to proline, but proline is, is very important if you have a very infested field. Okay, this is one that we did a little bit more recently that I kind of just wanted to show because it's it's uh, it gave me a lot of hope. <laughs> uh, we, we don't typically see a lot of chemistries that are very effective against this pathogen, but then in 2020, middle of the pandemic, we were able to do this small trial uh, where we saw things that uh, were good. So we evaluated some new products that are biologicals. Uh, Howler, which is a product from MacBiome, uh, and I cannot remember exactly what the microbe is, but it's a biological. And typically those products don't perform really well. Uh, but in this trial, we saw that it had some efficacy, which was good. And then we also tested rime, which is um, applied. Uh, it's, it doesn't have a label specifically for fusarium wilt of watermelon. It is labeled for other soil-borne diseases of watermelon. But we ended up testing it in this trial at request of a company, and we found that it actually has really good efficacy for this pathogen too. Um, this is a product from FNC, and um, I'm actually trying to work via IR4 and see maybe we can get it formally labeled for fun because it would maybe be in our chemistry that we can use. Uh, for the marketable yield, we didn't see as much of a difference, but again, this is it's really tricky to judge yields in the small plot trials that we do. So I always take that with a grain of salt, but it definitely disease-wise it is pretty effective. So we're looking at that one and then trying to look at Howler again. And I have here a little note that in 2021, we did a, almost the same trial where we put Howler mixed with half the rate of proline and it was very effective, uh, as effective as proline by itself. So I think Howler, again, could potentially become a partner for proline and Miravis Prime and maybe Rhyme moving forward. We need to look at it more, but it's something to keep an eye on. Okay, so I'm going to switch now to gummy stem light. Um, so gummy is caused by the fungus Stavanosporopsis cucurbitacearum. It has changed the name. It used to be the Dumela something, something, I can't remember. 
<laughs> but anyways, it affects the entire plant. Typically produces this very black uh, lesions in the foliage that tend to be in the edges of the foliars. But of course, it can also have fruit symptoms. Um, the funguses can be seed burn, and it can also survive in the soil, in weeds, in volunteers. Um, and it prefers warm, wet weather. So we see it a little bit later in the growth. Uh, so here's where I was talking about the symptoms. This one is a little bit easier to distinguish from our watermelon diseases because it tends to be more in the edges and it looks very dark, very necrotic. And then for someone that is trained, if you look at those lesions, you will see the fungal structures with a little lens. Uh, you can also have this type of stem lesions uh, that sometimes also appear with anthracnose. I'll show you later. So for gummy stem blight, uh, we actually have several products that are still working well for this disease, which is great. So this is data from 2020, uh, but you know, we have things like a Provia Top, Luna Experience, uh, again, Howler here in combination with a stronger product like Inspire Super also did really well. Um, so that is one that, you know, we still have a lot of options and I'm not showing this data here, but from other years of data, you know, things like Viathon also did really well. Um, Mary Vaughn. So we, we really have a few chemistries that are working for this one. And I will have this at the end of the presentation, but I have a link to my lab website where I have fact sheets for each one of these diseases. And for each fact sheet, I have sort of like listed like the stuff that is kind of working based on our trial. So essentially, if it's in that fact sheet, it's because it's still working uh, based on our efficacy data from North Carolina. So that always has sort of like the most updated information. We revise it every year. Uh, but we have several products working for this one, which is always good news. And we have other things coming down the pipeline. Um, an interesting Neurovis Prime and Proline, which, you know, we were talking about this for Fusarium. They also have some activity for uh, gummy stem blight. So, you know, we do have some products in watermelon that kind of hit several points, which is really, really good. Um, Let's talk to about anthracnose now. So this one is caused by Colotatrica morbicularii. It's an our fungal pathogen, also affects the entire plant. Um, it survives in crop residues, volunteer plants, water, and also seed. Um, so for this one, um, you typically will see um, just the foliar of lesions. I know in watermelon, I get a lot of people confusing anthracnose with downy mildew. Uh, down in mildew some years uh, has this smaller symptoms, uh, foliar lesions that look, look more like anthracnose. Anthracnose will have a little bit more of that like concentric ring look a little bit to the lesion. Gummy will look much darker. The lesions will be bigger. The lesions will be more in the edges of the leaves. But when it's like smaller, more widespread in the leaf, it's probably more on trackness or downy. And, and then, you know, with the train night, sometimes you can tell, but sometimes you have to look under the microscope for um, downy structures to really be sure. Um, you also have the fruit lesions, as you can see here, they're just typically sunken lesions and all these little dots in the middle are really like fungal structures that again, someone that has the training with a lens can, can see them. Um, for this one, we also have races. So we have race one, two, and three, although the more recognized ones, I would say that are race one and two, they are somewhat host specific. Uh, so the race two is believed to be really the one that goes to watermelon and race one is believed to be the one that goes to cucumber. This is not like a hundred percent. It's like 80%. Let's say they follow that, that notation. Um, but, but that's important to know um, just because things that maybe we see in cucumber are not gonna be true for watermelon. So it's important to keep that race structure in mind. There is some resistance um, in seed out there and that's available when you purchase like your seed catalogs from your seed companies, they will say like CO resistance to whatever race and then you will know that. Uh, for this one, we recommend a crop rotation out of like one, two years out of cucurbits if you have any issues with this one. And, you know, historically, we have been able to manage this disease really, really well with FRAC 11 uh, fungicides. So this includes like things like Cabrio, Quadris, Friesen, right? And within that fungicide family, we have sort of like sub modes of action. So for example, the fact that maybe we see that Cabrio is not as effective, is not going to mean that Quadris is not effective, which is not always what happens with every fungicide group. 
So something I wanted to point out is that we, we have heard reports probably since like 2020 that some states are seeing reduced efficacy with some of these products. Like I, I have to say that um, my counterparts actually formally have said that Quadris in Georgia and Virginia is not doing as well. I have also heard rumblings through the years about Cabrio. We have not seen that in North Carolina yet. I mean, I know from talking to agents, sometimes sort of there's perception that maybe Cabrio is not doing as well, but we have not seen a full failure. And I sadly cannot show you a lot of data that we have on some of these finding sets because all the trials we have done in the last three years are confidential. But I can tell you, at least from that, that Cabrio and Quadris have been included in those trials. And we have not seen failures in our trials here in the research stations when we use them. So it seems that um, a lot of this is actually being seen in cucumber, uh, not in water models. So the other disclaimer I wanted to make is that these observations I have heard more from cucumber in those other states. It has not been in watermelon. So there may be a race component there that maybe it is just race one that is having issues with some of these funding sites. But definitely keep an eye on it. And if you feel that in your watermelon fields, some of these products are not doing well, I would, I really want to hear about it. <laughs> so please send me an email because uh, we're trying to put together a project to uh, explore that. And it would be really important that I come and visit your field and take some samples if you feel that fungicides are not doing what they're supposed to be doing. So this is a really, really old trial. But, but again, based on newer data that I have that I cannot show you, this largely has not changed for us. So this was in cucumber though, disclaimer, but we have done this very similar thing in watermelon. And these products are really about the same ones that look okay, including Cabrio. Uh, but you know, Pristine, Mary Vaughan have done really well. Quadra stopped saying they inspires. Um, so um, I, I think so far I wouldn't sound the alarm in North Carolina, but it's something we're keeping an eye on just because our neighbors are seeing it already. Another thing I wanted to point out again is the resistance. So this is something that we did a long time ago for two years. We evaluated numerous uh, varieties of watermelon that included triploids, diploid, seedless. And there's definitely good resistance out there, especially if you partner even some of these lines that are maybe tolerant with some fungicides. Uh, even just protectants, you know, like Bravo or something like that. So uh, definitely, um, if you're having issues with this disease, take a, a minute to talk to your seed reps and find out what varieties, what varieties they may have uh, that are attractive to you that have some resistance because there is some decent resistance out there. Okay, and the last one that I wanted to talk about, because I only have 30 minutes, uh, was uh, Phytophthora capsaicin. <laughs> so this is one that we see every year in watermelon and other vegetables. This is not a fungus. It's something called an oomycete. It looks like a fungus, but it's actually more closely related to algae. Uh, it really likes water. Um, so, so another thing to, to, to think is that, you know, when, when we talk about control, about things like Phytophthora capsaicin and downy mildew, we talk about fungicides. But Phytophthora capsaicin and downy mildew are actually oomycetes. So really the products that we're thinking about for those are oomycetes. <laughs> and this is important because uh, things that will work for gummy and will work for anthracnose that are true fungi may not work for downy and picapsaceae because even though they look like a fungus, they're a completely different um, organism. So that's really important to keep in mind that this, these two require specific chemistries for all mycetes. So these are just some pictures of symptoms that picapsaceae can cause, you know, in cucurbits and fruit and watermelon specifically, of course, I don't have a picture, but uh, typically what we see is more this, that like white powder sugar covering our fruit uh, watermelon vines can be wilted by picapsaceae, but it's rare. We see the wilting symptoms more in your squashes, your pumpkins, and your peppers. In cucumber and watermelon, it's more the fruit symptoms that we see. For whatever reason, those vines tend to do a little bit better uh, with this pathogen than, let's say, your squashes and your pumpkins. This one is pretty difficult to control. It has a really broad host range. Um, so, you know, crop rotation is tricky and it survives in the soil for a very, very long time. And it can also um, 
develop pretty quickly fungicide resistance, which is always kind of like a concern. So it's one that we, we thankfully have a lot of chemistries available. So we're not as restricted as with downy in cucumbers, for example. Uh, this one, we have a lot of chemistries, but it's really important to be diligent about alternating modes of action. This is one that will become resistant and then you kind of like keep that resistant population in your field. So you don't want that. Um, so another thing that is really specific about this one is water management. So again, because it's like closely related to algae, it loves water. It actually has it's this big spore that when it touches water, it divides in, into many more spores. And those zoospores are called can swim and they have like little sensors to tell them where the plant is. So they're, they're very effective <laughs> at infecting something in the presence of water. So water management is really important. So this is a good example. You know, I went to this field. It was, it used to be beautiful. And then there was a, a big rain. The field was not even, there was uh, water sitting there. And of course that made Phytophthora explode and then it melted everything. And it'll just take like a day or two for this to happen. So once you have an event like this in an area where the water remains standing, there's no spray that's gonna save you. So it's really important to keep thinking about like, is my, is, am I having fields with peak capsaicin and then am I having water issues because I need to fix those to keep this thing away. Um, so yeah, again, so standing water is a problem. And then the other thing is calls. So, you know, sometimes people, I mean, we all obviously everyone has calls at the end and sometimes people would leave those close to water sources for irrigation. Like if you use surface water, if you use well water, you're fine, but surface water can become infested with this pathogen and then you effectively are irrigating your field with that infested water. So uh, that's something that we actually used to do uh, is check irrigation water and some for some operations that were having issues with the capsaicin and figure out if it was contaminated. Uh, there are sand filters and chlorination treatments that can effectively clean your water if you have that issue and you have to remain using that surface water. But it's important that you know if it is infested. And, and thankfully, the clinic a few years ago decided to now offer that service. So you can actually get uh, submit water from your surface water sources and get it tested for Phytophthora. And then you can make the decision if maybe it would be worth to get a, a water treatment system. Um, but again, this is only only surface water. Well water, city water are completely fine. That's something to keep an eye on. Um, so again, we're talking about fungicides. So it can become uh, fungicide resistant. Uh, some of the chemistries that are reported to not be so effective for the capsaicin here in NC would include uh, Ritomel and all variations of it, Presidio and Forum. Um, so those are the ones that sometimes we are a little bit careful about recommending depending on that field history because we definitely see resistance. Uh, the other thing is that the application timing is really important. The way you have to think about it in watermelon is that you're essentially trying to make like a force field around that fruit before it touches the ground because that's when it gets infected, right? Once that fruit touches the soil, that's when the pathogen gets in, especially if there's like a rain event. So it's important that that food is protected before it gets too big to really be sitting on that soil. So you want to start your sprays when the fruit is like, I don't know, softball size, that thing, and then get really good coverage as much as you can, and then you should be okay. Uh, so unless you keep an eye on the on the wet weather, the water, water events is what you need to be careful with. And... We have done a lot of trials in Picapsacy, even actually in collaboration with some of our neighboring states, just to see how, how things were looking. And this largely has not changed. Uh, you know, really, really good products will be Orondis. You know, Orondis has been a really good product for Picapsacy and Zampro, um, you know, Brandman, um, you know, Illumin. You know, there's really a lot of the chemistries that are listed here that do a good job. But I would say that really right now, probably around this is one that is doing really good for this pathogen. Uh, but remember about rotating modes of action is very, very important. And again, in my fact sheets, I list all the modes of action for all of these so that you can kind of check that a little bit. Uh, but yeah, just like take home message for this one, water management is really, really important. Uh, fungicide applications, you know, are a, a good timing to protect that fruit is really important. Uh, the products that we feel do really well right now are Orondis formulations, Sampro, Illumin, and Randman, as I was mentioning in the other slide. And a three-year rotation with non-host 
can be a good thing with this one because the oospores do start uh, becoming reduced if you go away from host. It's just that pretty much all you can do will be like, you know, field crops like cereals or something like that is the only thing that pickup doesn't go to because it has such a broad host range. So that's, that can be a little tricky. Um, and I'm pretty much done here, but I just wanted to leave this information here for people. This is my lab website. I have here a tab that is very specifically says for growers. <laughs> so here's where you will find fact sheets, all the results from our yearly trials. So if you're curious to see like, oh, I wonder how whatever fungicide did last year in Lena's trials, you just need to go in here and then you'll see what data we have for the previous year. And then we have like pest alerts that you will get through pest news if you subscribe to that and links to production guides like the Atkin manual and the Southeastern vegetable guide if you just need like a quick link to it. Uh, so all this information is there really updated. And with that, I would like to thank my lab for all their help because all the data I presented is theirs. And of course, research stations because they host all the trials we do and also grow cooperators uh, that we work with with on-farm things and the clinic, of course, and funding, which a lot of it for watermelon the last few years has mainly come from uh, CubeCat, a big SCRI project that we're part of. <laughs>